With that, uh, we are joined today by Ms. Lori Reed from Charlotte, North Carolina. Ms. Reed is the Assistant City Arborist for the City of Charlotte, and today she will discuss the biology, identification, ecology, and management of fall cankerworms with a focus on managing infestations in urban areas, though there will be some discussion of infestation management in natural areas as well. Uh, in case you weren't aware, the City of Charlotte has been dealing with canker worm issues for several years now. It's kind of a, a really interesting case study and they've done a lot of work to try to figure out how to manage these things. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Reed. Lori? All right. Well, thank you. I'm hoping that I'm loud and clear. Is that right? You sound good. All right. Good. Okay. Well, thank you for um, inviting me and thank you everyone for joining us today to learn about this pest that we have in Charlotte and, of course, other areas in the eastern United States as well. Um, as Dave said, it's, it's been a real issue in the city of Charlotte since the 80s. So this is something we've been battling and continue to fight. So, um, you know, like Dave said, please type your questions if you have them. I might answer them throughout this, so hopefully um, I'll give you all the information you need. But, of course, if you have questions, definitely let us know. I'll go ahead and dive in. All right, so what I'll be talking about is basically what is the fall canker worm? How do you identify it? What kind of damage does it cause? Um, why is it a big issue? And what kind of control, what sort of management can be done for this particular insect? So canker worms, I'll get a little, I'm, I'm an entomologist by education, so I'll get a little bug nerdy on you here. Um, they're in the group of moths called a geometrid. And um, what that, that word, if you break it down, means earth measurer, a geometrid. And so if you've probably seen them, I know when I was a kid, I loved playing with caterpillars. And another name for these guys are inchworms or loopers. So when you watch them, how they walk, they've got legs up near the front. So they've got those six legs, like all insects have, near the front of their head. And at the back end of their body, um, the opposite end of their head, they have um, a couple pairs of pro legs or false legs. They're just used to hold on. And how they walk is they stretch out, they grab with their front legs, they let go with their back legs, and their body kind of squishes up in like an arch form. And then they reach out with their front legs and stretch out. So it looks like they're measuring as they're walking. So that's how they got their name. And canker worms, we actually have a spring and a fall canker worm. The one that causes the most issues in Charlotte is the fall canker worm, but we do see these caterpillars active about the same time of the year. Both of these, um, the spring and the fall, both of them have wingless females, which is kind of creepy. You'll see a picture in a little bit. Um, you know, most of the time you see a moth, they have these big, beautiful wings. The males of the canker worms do have wings. They fly around, but the females don't. Like I said, the caterpillars for both of these species, the spring and the fall canker worms, are active at the same time of the year, and they cause the same kind of damage. They're both defoliators. They're both chewing on the leaves of trees. If you really want to get nerdy and go ahead and identify between this two, these two species of caterpillars, there are some ways you can identify them. The caterpillars sort of look similar. Um, there's a couple phases, different coloration of the fall canker worm. Usually they're kind of like a light, pale green color with these white racing stripes down the sides of their body. Um, so running from the head to the tail along the sides of the body. Sometimes we can, when we have outbreaks, Sometimes those caterpillars can be a really dark form where they'll have the white stripes along the side of the body and they have a big black band running from, if you look at them from the top down, running from the head to the back side. The spring canker worm, if you look at those pro legs, remember I was talking about that, they have true legs up near the front, near the head, um, and then they have the, the, the pro legs back at the back side. And if you look at these guys, so this is the fall canker worm. So here's its head. Here are those six true legs up near the front. And these are the pro legs in the back right here. So the fall canker worm has one, two, and a half little pro legs right here at the back side. So one, two, and a half. The spring canker worm won't have this one right here. It'll just have these back two. But like I said, they are kind of similar colors. 
Um, the spring canker worm, the, the moths come out in the spring, so that's probably how they got their name. Um, usually those are coming out in February and March, where the fall canker worm, those adults are coming out in the fall, I mean technically the winter, but they're coming out a little bit earlier in the year, December and January typically in the Charlotte area. The spring canker worm, they lay their eggs loosely in bark crevices. So it'll just be a couple eggs here and there in the bark crevices, usually around February to April. The fall canker worm, the eggs are laid on twigs. So these nice little masses of eggs, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a little bit. Um, and that's going to be pretty soon after they come up out of the ground. But like I said, the caterpillars of both of these species are hatching about the same time in the early spring. They're both causing the same sort of damage. So it's not really imperative to know the difference when you're worrying about the caterpillars. So fall cankerworm. Like I said, this is the one that's really the pest in Charlotte. Um, this is a native insect. Um, a lot of times when we have issues with insects, um, sometimes it's the ones that are not native to the United States that cause them most problems. But this, this little moth, this little caterpillar is native to the United States. It can be found from Canada down to Georgia, moving west to California, Montana, New Mexico, and Utah. So it has a pretty wide range that we find this insect. And this insect, um, it has one generation per year. And a generation is egg to adult. So just one time during the year, we're going to see the caterpillars. You'll see the eggs, the pupa, and the adult. Just that one time during the year. There's un some insects that have many generations during the year. Um, think of like a mosquito. Um, it will have you know, several generations. But this cankerworm just has that one per year. So learning about the biology of this insect, um, the egg stage is um, the, the female moth is going to be laying those eggs. So when she climbs up out of the ground, I'll tell you more kind of closely and show you pictures, but um, the female moth hatches from her pupa out of the ground, climbs up the side of the tree, and lays eggs on twigs. And like I said, for this fall canker worm, they're laid in these nice masses on those twigs. Those eggs are going to hang around for about three to four months. The caterpillars, we generally see them feeding for about five to six weeks. They're the ones that are causing issues. They're the ones that are actively defoliating the tree. The pupa stage is that stage between the caterpillar and the adult. That's the resting stage where it goes from looking like this little worm right here to turning into a moth. That is um, the longest part of the year. So that will be there for about seven months. The adults are extremely short-lived, sometimes up to a month, sometimes less than that. If you see this female right here, she doesn't have wings. She doesn't even have feeding mouth parts. So her job is to mate and lay eggs, and that's her entire job. That's all that she set out to do. The males do have wings on the back, so they're the ones that are flying around. They search for the females. So this is what the cankerworm looks from the top. Some people, I guess, liken it to a spider. Um, I can sort of see that. It's just got one big body part and then a bunch of legs. So she's wingless, can't fly around, can't go anywhere. The pupa is in the ground. They hatch out. They climb up the side of a tree or a fence post or whatever they happen to be on, any kind of vertical structure, and climb up to the tree to lay their eggs. And again, this is going to be in the winter time, usually December and January in Charlotte. And what uh, entomologists have found is usually we see them starting to emerge after we get a cold snap. So after you get one or two frosts, that change in the temperature triggers that insect to want to come up out of the ground and lay eggs. Generally, most insects are not very active in the wintertime. It's cold. Insects are cold-blooded. They need heat to be able to move around. But this particular insect, that's just part of its life. It does the best in the wintertime. That's the time when she wants to lay eggs. Each female can lay to between 100 and 200 eggs in her life. That's a lot of caterpillars for each female. I'll talk to you some statistics about some of our cankerworm trapping that we do here in Charlotte. Um, we do some monitoring of traps. And on one particular trap, they capture over 5,000 female cankerworms. That's a ton of potential caterpillars coming on that one tree. Again, like I said, the eggs are laid in masses, usually at the ends of the twigs, because those caterpillars want to feed on 
those newly fresh emerging leaves. So she's a good mama. She climbs all the way up to the tippy top of that tree to lay those eggs so her caterpillars have food right as soon as they hatch out of those eggs. So here is a picture of a small caterpillar. This is on a ruler, so it's about a half inch in length, um, light green in color, and here are those white kind of racing stripes down the side of its body. When these caterpillars first start feeding, they cause what we call shot hole damage. So the leaves will just have little holes chewed through them, and eventually they'll start feeding along the edge of the leaves as they get bigger, and then work all the way where you'll just have this, this central midrib or sometimes these larger veins that are left. All these are canker worms feeding on one of these leaves. So it can be extremely massive the amount of caterpillars that we see on these trees. Um, this is one of the darker forms of the caterpillar. So here's its head, and here's that black racing stripe down the top side of its body right there. So this is the darker form of there. Um, I actually took this picture at Carowinds um, theme park that's a little bit south of Charlotte. Um, took my kids there this spring, and unfortunately, I can't stop seeing these things. They're everywhere. Um, and, you know, sometimes you just see them. Um, oh, hey, Dave, are you there? Yeah, Lori. Okay, yeah, I just kept a really weird message. Okay, sorry. Yep. Um, so this is actually on an, an on the ash tree. So here's that little bud right here of an ash tree. But here's that tiny little caterpillar. You can see how small that, that little guy is right there. Um, and these caterpillars, they have these silken threads. So if they're disturbed or if they need to escape an enemy or um, they need to, to find new food, they'll drop down on these little lifelines, a little silken thread. And that's probably one of the irritating parts that, that we see in the city of Charlotte, is if you bump a tree or your car door hits a branch, you'll get all these caterpillars coming down. And it's, it's like Christmas ornaments hanging on a tree. It's kind of gross and creepy looking. And then of course, you know, you're trying to walk to your car or get to work and they're in your hair and down your shirt, on your work bag. It's just, it's really irritating and really messy. Um, because this is an animal that eats, this is an animal that poops. Um, insect poop is called frass. And so if you have a lot of these, you can actually hear all the frass coming down through the leaves. If you're sitting outside under like an umbrella or something, it can, um, it sounds like it's raining. So it, it's really, really annoying when we get really high populations of these insects. Another thing these caterpillars can do is they use these silken threads um, to balloon. So they'll release the silken thread, it gets caught on the air, and they can use it to move from tree to tree. Um, so they can get around. I mean, they're not like actively trying to go to trees, but you know, you'll get like a nice wind and it can blow it to the next one. Or they might drop down and the wind picks them up and takes them. So they can move, not like really far, just adjacent to where they were. And when they get ready to change into a pupa, they come down in mass. And so you can have just tons of these canker worms coming down on fence posts, across driveways, on your car. Just very, very annoying having these guys every single place. So these caterpillars in Charlotte, willow oaks are one of our top trees that are planted in our city. It's also one of their favorite trees to feed on. But they'll really not feed on a variety of oaks. Um, we found them on cherry trees. They, they've had a really big impact on ornamental cherries that we have planted um, around the city of Charlotte. They'll feed on Japanese maple, just regular red maple, ash trees, dogwoods, um, just lots of different trees. They'll feed on shrubs, too. If they get down and there's azaleas planted, they'll sometimes eat those as well. Um, you get a lot of caterpillars. They need a lot of food. One thing that they don't eat, though, they don't tend to eat um, evergreen species. So pine trees, you won't see them on that, or magnolias, or holly. So something with like a really thick, leathery type leaf, we generally won't see that. Like I said earlier, they do feed for about five to six weeks. 
And that's a long time. We usually don't see the caterpillars when they're teeny tiny, when they're first doing that little shot hole feeding. It's once they start getting bigger and you start seeing where all that's left is that midrib, that center part of that leaf, or they, they start dropping down. Um, that's usually when people start getting annoyed. And then usually it's like the last two weeks of their feeding. But that's a long time to have these things getting in your hair. Um, when they're fully grown, they're about uh, an inch long. And they do drop to the ground because that pupa is in the ground underneath the soil. So this is what the pupa looks like. Um, they, they tend to be a little bit lighter and will get a little bit darker as they age. And this is the longest part of its life cycle. So these caterpillars are going to be feeding um, usually in March, April, um, maybe even into May in some cases, depending on the weather. The warmer the winter, we tend to see the caterpillars active earlier. Um, and then they feed for those five to six weeks. They crawl down to the ground, make their pupa in the soil, and then they sit there the rest of the spring, the entire summer, the rest of the fall, until they get ready to hatch out and start or emerge from that, that cocoon and climb up the side of the tree for the females or fly around and look for the females if it's a male. So this is the longest part of its life cycle right here. So why is this insect a problem? Um, as I mentioned, we've had an outbreak of these canker worms in Charlotte since 1987. Um, Generally, what happens with a native insect, remember this is native to the United States, um, usually what we see with a native insect is we will get, um, you'll get outbreaks every now and again. So the populations will build up the numbers and they get so big, but you have natural enemies. So you'll have sometimes viruses or fungus or insects that feed on it. Um, the weather can cause a decrease in population and it causes that pest to start declining. So it may be two, three, four years of being an outbreak, and then they decline for a period of years, and then they build back up again and decline. It's just this little cyclic pattern, and this will happen periodically. But in Charlotte, we're not seeing that. The natural enemies, weather, um, you know, other things that like to eat them, are not causing a decline in that population. It's been something that's frustrated us that live in people that live in Charlotte and entomologists, um, some theories about why these insects have just been in this outbreak status in our city. As I mentioned, a lot of our trees in the city of Charlotte, we have a lot of willow oaks, which is that preferred host that these, these caterpillars like to feed on. Um, some of our older neighborhoods in the city have been planted since um, the early 1900s, like 1910, 1920. Willow oaks have been planted there, and that's, that's all the street trees are. Um, the trees in the yard, the trees along the street, um, you know, between the street and the sidewalk, they tend to be willow oaks. Um, that's a native tree. It does really well in our soil type. It does really well around Charlotte area, um, and it's a big, beautiful shade tree, so it's been planted a lot throughout our city. So that's one theory, is we have a lot of its host. And um, another idea, um, Dr. Frank at North Carolina State University did a study looking at habitat complexity. And um, North, if you're not familiar, NC State is in Raleigh, which is the capital of our state. And so he, what he did was, is he looked at different habitats, a city habitat and kind of a natural area within around the Raleigh area. And what they did is they looked at how many different tree and undershore species were there and what was the density, how many plants were in that area. And what he found is urban areas tend to have the lowest diversity of plant species and also has lower density of plants as well. In a forested or a natural type system, there's a lot more tree diversity. There's a lot more understory and overstory and a lot of different species, lots of different types are out there. In that natural area, we don't tend to see as much damage to trees due to the canker worm as we do in the urban area. So, so he's kind of tying in, linking that lack of complexity, diversity, and number of plants definitely allows these canker worms to have more of a problem in an urban area as opposed to a natural system. So control. 
Like I said, there's, there's some natural enemies out there that will cause an impact to canker worms. Um, there are some spraying programs, either if it's an aerial spray from an airplane or a helicopter, or even just on the ground by an arborist. So you can use some, some products to help control these caterpillars. And we also have a banding program, a tree banding program. So I'll talk about each one of these. So for some natural controls, there is a Telenomus wasp that lays its eggs on the eggs of the canker worm. So those little baby wasps that are hatching out will eat those little canker worm eggs. So that causes a decrease in the population. Um, so that, that's a good thing. That's a host that we like to have. Um, we also have a species, or a genus rather, a genus of ground beetles, um, a parabid, called a fiery searcher or a caterpillar hunter. There's actually several species in this calisoma genus that will get out there and they'll hunt and they'll eat those caterpillars. They definitely do cause an impact on the number of caterpillars that are out there. Sometimes we get some strange weather. So this, um, this past year in Charlotte, we had a pretty warm winter. And then, which is typical of our area, we had a, a late spring frost. And what we think, this year we had definitely lower numbers of canker worms in our city. So we're thinking that um, that late spring frost either killed that newly emerging foliage. So as those brand new leaves are just starting to bud out, the cold got to them killed the leaves, and so the caterpillars didn't have anything to eat, or it may have um, had an impact actually on the caterpillars. So sometimes that, that weird shift in weather is actually beneficial for us, not the canker worms. This is that caterpillar hunter, that fiery searcher beetle. Um, it's probably, it's over an inch in size, so it's a very large ground beetle. Um, this is on a deck board, so if you can imagine, you know, the width of the deck board. Um, they're bright green, they're shiny, and this little guy right here actually has a portion of a canker worm that it was chewing on right there. Um, these are the good guys. They are ground beetles, so we'll see them running around the ground looking for these caterpillars. They will climb up the tree as well to try to seek out these caterpillars. So these are good guys. If you happen to see them, what I always try to tell people, um, some people are a little bit more squeamish about insects than, than entomologists tend to be. Um, but I always tell people, if you see this, this caterpillar hunter and it happens to come into your house, shoosh it outside, put it out. We want to keep that in the environment. We want to keep it out there. And we want them to continue to eat our, our canker worm caterpillars to help us in our fight right there. Um, some people, I guess because it's bright green and shiny, some people might think that it looks like a June bug or um, a Japanese beetle, just completely different sizes. And they're also active at different times during the year. So we're going to see this in that springtime um, where you're going to see the June bugs, like its name, a little bit later in the summertime. So this, this is a good guy. You want this guy out there. So as far as spraying, um, there are some chemicals that that you can physically use to kill these caterpillars. But a lot of the, the chemicals um, are broad spectrum, meaning that they're going to kill the good insects out there. You know, so think of like your orthene or your seven dust or something like that. They're going to kill the good guys and the bad guys. So if you are going to use any kind of spray program to actually kill these caterpillars, um, you do want to use something that's specific to a caterpillar and also something that isn't going to harm your, your good, your beneficials, the good guys that are out there eating the bad guys. And one of those products is Bt, which this is a bacteria, um, Bacillus thuringiensis, um, Christachii. One of the couple common names of the product is Dipel and Thuricide. So these are products that a homeowner can buy or a product that you can have an arborist apply to your trees to kill these caterpillars. Probably the, the really important thing that, I, that we do like to let the public know and let everyone know that this BT is specific to caterpillars. Um, I'm pretty sure that mosquito larvae might have a, an impact, might have an impact on them too, but that's not a bad thing. 
Um, but it's very specific. It does not harm your beneficial insects. It does not harm any wildlife. And it doesn't harm humans either. This is a naturally occurring bacteria. It's in the soil. It's out there. It's nothing that's going to make people sick or, or cause a problem to your skin or anything like that. So it's, it's a really great product. So the important thing, if you are doing any kind of spray, whether you're spraying from like a helicopter, like what we, not at the city, we don't do this very often, but in the past we have, I'll talk about that in a minute, but we've done sprays from helicopters and sprays from airplanes, or if you're getting an arborist to spray your trees for these caterpillars, getting the timing is really important. You want to get it when those caterpillars are small, less than a half inch in size. So you have to really be on it and know when those caterpillars are out there. Um, usually at this time when the caterpillars are really small, the damage to the tree is going to be pretty minor. And the leaves, when you want to spray, you want to do it when the leaves have, have fully expanded. This bacteria, um, think of it as like little bits of flour, right? Like little spores that are coming down from that spray. It lands on the leaf. The caterpillar eats it. It gets in their stomach and it disrupts their stomachs. They can't eat, basically. They can't digest food, and so they die. Um, so they have to physically eat this. It doesn't land on their body and cause a problem. They have to actually ingest it. So you want to get it out there when you have a leaf surface to receive those little spores, and um, also when those caterpillars are little and eating and eating and eating. When the caterpillar is greater than a half inch, this chemical does not have as much effect on these caterpillars. So you really have to get it pretty early in that feeding cycle. And again, this is a natural bacteria. It's all over the place. The insect has to physically eat it and pick it up that way. So in Charlotte, we've had a couple aerial sprays. Um, probably the most recent one was 2008 where um, 65,000 acres were sprayed by an airplane at a cost of $1.18 million. This is very expensive. Um, the, the city of Charlotte, we're about 300 square miles, so about 190,000 acres. So we have a lot of trees out there, a lot of land out there. So this did not by any means cover um, a big majority of our city. How we determine where we're going to spray is we look at areas where we've historically had outbreaks or had outbreaks in the very recent past. And so we target those areas um, for the spray. And I'll show some maps um, to show you where we have um, kind of outbreaks in the past years. Um, in 1992, we did a spray by helicopter. In 1998, we sprayed twice during that year. So it can be extremely expensive. So one of the, the programs that we do here in the city of Charlotte is we um, trap. We put bands up on trees to trap the females as they're climbing up out of the ground. And there's no insecticides applied, so there's not going to have any effect on beneficials or native insects other than the cankerworm. And it can be very effective if it's used widely and those bands are maintained. I'll show you some pictures, and that will make a little bit more sense that statement. Um, so the U.S. Forest Service has determined on a trap, if greater than 91 females are trapped, they consider that a high infestation. Just remember that number. So what the banding is, is basically we just put this band around a tree, and there's a couple different types. We have this sticky trap or a tangle foot band that we can apply, or we have this product called a bug barrier. They act a little bit different. The tangle foot band is a component system. So there's, there's a couple different pieces that you have to put together to make this band work. And what it is, it's under here, under this black part right here, is cotton batting or insulation. And then it's wrapped in either tar paper, like what we saw in this picture. So this is tar paper on the outside of that cotton batting. This is kind of like um, saran wrap, basically. But you use it for packing. They come in these little spools, and you wrap it around the tree. And then you put this product called Tanglefoot. It's a very sticky, it's resin and oils on top of there. And 
as the females are walking up the side of that tree, they get stuck in the tangle foot. They can't get past there, and so we're physically trapping them. The problem is, is the sticky is on the outside. So leaves and other things will get stuck in the side. Sometimes you'll see lizards on these, which are kind of sad, and, and other insects on the side of these trees other than um, the canker worms. Um, it, it, it usually is the least expensive product. So, you know, like I said, there's, there's several parts. So you have that cotton batting and insulation that's against the tree. You either wrap that in tar paper or plastic wrap, and then you get the tangle foot product and put that on there. Um, you just kind of do about a three to five inch band. You use a putty knife. Definitely wear gloves because the stick is stuff is really, really sticky. Um, wear clothes that you do not care about because it does stain. It kind of leaves an oily residue. Um, and stick it on that band. There's another product if you can't find the brand Tanglefoot um, called Stick and Stop. It's the same general idea. And so you put that band on the side of the tree. And these are all female canker worms stuck on the side of that tree right there. Um, there is a, a group here in Charlotte called Midwood Tree Banding. It's just a company that you can contract with, and they will ban trees in your yard. And so just to get a general idea about the cost for um, a small tree might be $15. A really large tree, you know, over 30 inches, might be $45 per tree for them to band it for you. If you buy the, the individual parts yourself, it's probably less than that. Um, it's really important for these really big, large willow oak trees. They have um, lots of little cracks and crevices in the side of it. So that cotton batting, it's really important if, if you are applying these bands to trees that you kind of stick that cotton batting down so it's really tight against the bark of the tree because you want to make sure that you're not leaving space behind that band that that female can't just crawl right behind it. Um, what we'll use to attach, if you have a tree with, you know, lots of undulations going in and out, um, you can actually use staples. Don't use nails, but you can use, um, you know, short staples, and you can staple it, that cotton batting, to the bark of the tree. And um, it really has very little effect on trees. The staples do. You know, staple that down so you're getting all those nice undulations nice and filled with that cotton batting. And the same thing if you're using tar paper. Um, you know, just make sure that if you're using that sticky, that saran wrap kind of consistency, make sure that's pressed really well so we're not leaving a, a little pathway for that, that canker worm female to get behind. The other system is the Bug Barrier Band. That's the name of the company is Bug Barrier. Um, this picture is not the highest quality, but it was from their website. Um, this is, it's a, it's a system. It's only two parts. You have the cotton batting that's behind it, and then you have this plastic wrap that you put around a tree. And the sticky stuff that's capturing those female canker worms is on the underside of this plastic. So with the tanglefoot, the sticky was on the outside. With the bug barrier, the sticky stuff is on the inside of that plastic closest to the bark of the tree. So when the female, she walks up the side of the tree, she hits that cotton batting, and she turns and she starts walking out to go around it, she gets stuck on the sticky stuff on the inside of that plastic. Um, the good thing about this is the sticky is on the inside, so it's less likely to capture leaves and, um, and other things on the outside, of like what the, the Tanglefoot band did. This product is definitely more expensive than that Tanglefoot or that component system. And squirrels love to get to this cotton batting. Um, unlike the tango foot band that had the tar paper over or the, the plastic wrap over the cotton batting so it wasn't exposed to squirrels, this is open. So they love to come in here and pull this stuff out. They'll chew on this plastic. So sometimes you do get squirrel damage with this. So some issues that we have with the banding. The timing is definitely one of those issues that we have. Um, you want to put, especially if you're using the Tanglefoot one, um, you definitely want to use, put these bands out after the trees have defoliated, but you also want to get it before those female moths have started crawling up out of the ground. So here is a component of the Tanglefoot band without Tanglefoot. So this female had already started coming out. 
um, and so that there's nothing sticky to stop her. So you want to put it after the tree defoliates, but before the females come out. There's definitely some maintenance involved with this, the tanglefoot style band. Um, if the tanglefoot has any kind of debris on it, it could cause a bridge for those females. So all these leaves that are right here, if she can walk up across these leaves, she can make a bridge and maybe get past all the sticky tanglefoot and make her way up the top of the tree. Um, so you, that's part of the reason why you want to put it after the trees defoliate. One issue we do see sometimes is when you have a lawn service or you blow your leaves and you have your tanglefoot out there, you get that leaf blower, it just blows up and gets stuck all over that, that sticky tanglefoot. If it gets to a case like this, you may have to um, either scrape it off, which doesn't sound like any fun to me, or um, just take off this very outside and put on a new band and new tangle foot if it gets really clogged up. So this is just one out um, in kind of on the edge of a forest, so you have a lot of males, moths stuck on the side of that one. And this is the cankerworm banding from the Charlotte area. Um, these are all female cankerworms. Um, remember that number that I told you that the Forest Service said that greater than 91 females on a trap is an outbreak? Yeah, I'd say this tree would be in an outbreak area. Um, there's sometimes that we've had bands that have had over 5,000 of these adult female cankerworms on the band. And something like this, it's clogged up. It has a lot of cankerworms on it. It has leaves. This could definitely bridge and allow other females to cross it. Um, this is just a weird little curiosity. This is, you know, in this little red circle, that's a female cankerworm. I had a call from a homeowner that was concerned about his bands, and those cankerworms were so small this year. And when I went out there, started looking, and what he had was, these are called columbula um, springtails. They're just these little insects that live in kind of moist vegetation, and they were jumping up and getting on his bands, and he was concerned. Um, but they, they weren't canker worms. They were just something odd that just happened to be there. Um, so, so when you do have this band system, like I said, it's very important to have some sort of maintenance for these to make sure they stay clean so that you can actually capture these female moths as they're crawling up the side of the tree. And also, we need to remove these bands in April. Um, usually the beginning to middle of April in Charlotte is what we recommend as to when to move, remove those bands off of the trees. Um, you don't want to leave them on year round. It doesn't do anything. One generation per year, you know, they're, the cankerworm females are only active during a certain time. But these traps do capture caterpillars as they balloon down or they fall down. They might, as they climb up the side of the tree, they can get stuck in this tangle foot as well. So we have had an issue with availability of Tanglefoot. Um, this particular product, um, the, the original manufacturer had stopped making it a couple years ago. There's a little bit of a panic in the Charlotte area. Um, Scott has now taken over and now manufactures it. Um, and they're, they're saying they're going to continue to manufacture this and it should be available. But every now and again, you'll, we'll, in Charlotte, we'll get a run on Tanglefoot and people will stockpile up and get five gallon buckets of it. and um, kind of hoard this tanglefoot material. Um, when we do banding, for us in Charlotte, it's really best if this is a community effort. So um, just the city, we do use contractors to ban street trees, so trees that are located along the street between the street and the sidewalk. But we only ban about 5,000 trees every single year. In our tree inventory, we have 180,000 street trees. Um, again, we're, we're banding willow oak trees primarily, and the, the trees that we banned, we banned our larger willow oaks, so trees over 24 inches in diameter, um, willow oak trees are what we're targeting for our banding. And we do need community support. So um, the City of Charlotte has a tree banding neighborhood matching grant where, where different neighborhoods can apply for a grant and they can receive up to $3,000 every year to go towards ban buying banding supplies and banding trees in their neighborhood. So it's a matching program. They can match it with donations or money or just um, volunteer hours. So just um, get, you know, neighborhoods getting together and talking about different things. They're, they're trying to get neighborhoods to have more continuity and, and get together. 
So um, it's, it's just really neat. The neighborhood where I used to live is called Plaza Midwood, and every fall they have a big party in the park called the Fall Crawl, where people can buy cankerworm banding supplies, and they have vendors, and people sell food, and it's, it's a really neat event. So some neighborhoods go really all out around cankerworms. So why do we want to control a native insect? It's native. It's here. It's been here. Um, so we have defoliation. So this is a willow oak tree that the leaves have been completely defoliated off those trees. And this is a picture of older willow oak trees completely defoliated. So where they should look like these other trees in the springtime having nice brand new fresh green leaves, they're completely defoliating those trees right there. And we know that trees that are repeatedly defoliated, so repeated year after year, two to three years, definitely has an impact on tree health. Young trees, trees that are newly planted, or trees that are weakened are more susceptible to having injury or having some kind of long-term health effects due to this cankerworm defoliation. Um, what they can cause, if repeated defoliation can cause branches to die. Um, I apologize, my phone is ringing. Um, you can get reduced growth rates so the tree will slow down in its growth. And sometimes, especially if we have a lot of stress on trees, um, the tree can actually succumb, not just to the canker worms. That's just like an added stress on that tree. Um, so if you think about it, the trees have just put out brand new leaves, and the caterpillars come by and they eat all those leaves off. Well, that tree has to live. It has to make food throughout the rest of the spring and summer, and so it has to expend its stored resources to make new leaves. Um, to come out. So they will use that stored energy and have to put on brand new leaves. So that can definitely cause an impact on that tree. And once you add other stresses like drought and where they're planted, a lot of our big willow oak trees that we have around the city of Charlotte are planted in a planting area between the street and the sidewalk that's eight feet wide. And you've got a 40-inch willow oak tree growing in that small space. That's stressful for the tree. Um, and, you know, any kind of compaction or construction near that tree. Older trees are definitely more susceptible to stress and insects and diseases. They can't fight it off as well. And then we do have a lot of root rot problems with our older trees. So the tree that has root rot, it's not taking up as much water as it needs. And then you get these nasty caterpillars that eat all the leaves off of that tree. And that tree is stressed because it has to use a lot of energy. It's expensive to remove big trees. That's another re reason why we do want to control this in insect. Not only are we impacting the tree health, but as that tree is declining or is dead, um, it's really expensive to remove a 40 to 60 inch willow oak tree, especially if it's close to a residence. Um, we're losing tree canopy. That's a really important thing for the city of Charlotte. We want to have 50% uh, of the city covered in trees by the year 2050. Our city council made that goal. So, um, you know, we don't want to lose these big trees. Um, you know, trees provide a lot of really great services. You know, they give us clean air and clean water, and they, they capture carbon and provide wildlife habitats, all those great ecosystem services that the trees provide. And then, um, you know, for us, so the trees are what makes Charlotte Charlotte. And, well, my opinion, of course, I love trees. It's what I do for my job. But I hear that from a lot of people that live here as well. Um, you know, trees provide shade. So... Um, we have this heat island effect. Hopefully, probably most people have heard about that. But without trees shading, you know, the sun comes down, the concrete and the asphalt holds that heat during the day and radiates back at night. So cities are much hotter than rural areas because there's nothing to cause that shade. So those trees are giving us that nice shade to reduce that heat island effect. And, of course, energy savings. That's always a great thing as well. So, you know, we're losing trees. We're losing all these great things that the trees do for us. In a forest, really short, um, we generally don't do a whole lot of control. Um, usually the outbreaks are short-lived. Um, there's a lot of, remember I was talking about that North Carolina study, that, that lots of plant diversity. Um, so the lower plant diversity, more likely to have an outbreak. In a forest, you have a lot of different species of trees, and they tend to just have a really short-lived outbreak. And usually your natural enemies will 
will keep these in control. So we usually don't do a whole lot of control. Most people don't ban. If you live on the edge of a forest or you have a lot of acreage and you have an area that you that you are there where you live, if you have a lot of canker worms, usually one thing what we tell people to do is to ban the trees closest to where you live, where you park your cars, or you know where you tend to spend most of your time. It's hard to ban hundreds of trees if you have a lot of property. Um, and you don't have to ban, you know, the, the very tiniest of trees. You might be able to use that BT if you want to. Um, but, you know, you do want to ban your, your really tall trees because they'll be dropping down, the caterpillars will be dropping down from those onto your understory trees. Um, if you have a lot of trees, really focus on those larger trees, the ones that could have their health impacted by that defoliation. So the city of Charlotte, we do monitoring. We put out about 135 bands that we kill back and we count the number of females on those bands. So this little tiny green dot is 1 to 99. This kind of Carolina blue dot is 100 females to 499. You can see how many of these traps that we had around the city that the Forest Service would, continue, would say are outbreak status. And there's 2014 and 2015. So it moves around the city. It's not consistent. It's not in the same place every time from year to year. It, it, it's hard for us to predict where it's going to have an outbreak from year to year. Um, like I said, we're, our natural controls are just not reducing the outbreak in the city of Charlotte. Um, we do have that banding program that the city helps sponsors. We do really rely on private homeowners to ban their trees and, you know, we, we want everyone to band together to fight the canker worm is, is our little motto. Aerial application or just spray application is always an option. It is a little bit more expensive and um, citizens and homeowners do get concerned about the potential effect that that BT may have on their pets or their plants or other species of insects. Um, but, but we generally, with that BT, we generally haven't seen an impact on, um, you know, it doesn't harm plants if it lands on it. Again, it's something that the caterpillars have to physically take up. So um, I appreciate you all um, spending this time with me and learning about canker worms and learning about the issues that we have in Charlotte. Um, and I will take any questions that you have, or Dave, if you want to facilitate it. Um, that's my email address and my cell phone number if you have questions or want pictures or more information about what, what we do here in Charlotte. Um, I'd be glad to share it All with right, you. All right. Thank you, Lori. Great, great job. I'll go ahead and facilitate some of these questions. We had a number of them come in. Uh, going back, do rodents eat the pupae, and does that provide any level of control? Sure. So I know um, in areas where gypsy moth is a big problem, they do actually see an impact on the those rodents eating the pupa in the soil. So I don't see why we wouldn't have the same um, the same thing happening here. I don't really honestly think it has a whole lot of level of control. Um, one thing that homeowners here in Charlotte will often ask us, well, why don't you just spray the soil and get that pupa? Um, those pupa are really tough. Nothing's getting through that, that, that outer covering. They're, they're really, um, they're, they're there and really um, not allowing things to, to enter into the skin that's going to have an effect on there. So I don't know, honestly know if they've had any kind of um, data or, you know, anything like that to let us know if those rodents are actually causing a, a, an impact on the pupa. Okay, and then a couple, I guess a related question, how about birds? I know for gypsy moth and EAB, there's some uh, relationship between those larvae and the number of birds and birds using control. Does that happen with the caker worms at all? Oh, yeah. Yeah, birds will definitely eat them. Lizards will eat them. If they get stuck in spider webs, I've seen spiders eat them. But again, how much impact that's actually happening, um, I don't, I don't have any kind of information on that. But you know, anything that's going to eat those, I think, is a great thing. Okay. Now, <clears throat> speaking of birds, when you apply the BT spray, mm -hmm. does that affect all caterpillars? And have there been issues with removing caterpillars, leaving no food for migratory birds and other wildlife? I do not believe, and Dave, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I do not. I not believe that eating an insect that has had BT, that has eaten BT, will have an effect on its predator. 
I would concur. I think if, if something eats, so on one hand, if something eats a caterpillar that has just eaten BT, I don't think it's going to harm what ate it, the bird. Yeah. Now, I'm thinking the question might have been, and this is from Melissa Creasy, I think she's getting at, if you get rid of all these caterpillars, does that oh. leave the birds a void without something to eat? I'm sorry. Okay, I did misunderstand. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes. So that is the one thing. I don't think they'd be devoid. I don't think we're ever going to get rid of canker worms. Um, I agree. Yes, when migratory birds are coming, especially the time of year when canker worms are, are very active, um, that is probably a very high food source out there. I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, but there are other types, like, you know, there's, um, well, you know, spring tiger worms feeding at the same time. Um, but I, I don't, I wouldn't think that it would have that large of an impact. For us, we're never, ever going to spray the entire city. It's just way too expensive. So we'll never, ever knock down the entire population in forested areas. You know, those birds will be there um, looking for that forest areas, and the caterpillars will be in there as well. Where we're spraying is mostly in the urban areas. Okay. So regarding pupation, how far away from the trees do they pupate? Uh, do they just drop straight down, or do they tend to crawl away a little bit? They crawl away a small amount. You know, they're not going like a half mile or quarter mile away. They're not going very far. And sometimes, um, you know, they'll be within like 100 feet of a tree. So no, they're not going very far. Although I've had had people tell me that where their tree is, they'll climb across the ground onto their front porch and the caterpillars will be there. You know, so it could be, you know, across the front yard that they're going to, that they're going to be crawling. Okay. But um, not super duper far. Do you standardize the DBH of trees that are banded? Uh, because for this person, a larger DBH willow oak would have more females than a smaller DBH one. So when we do banding, but with the city bands, the trees that we band are trees that are 24 inches and greater in diameter is what we at the city or our contractors band for us. Um, at someone's home, um, you know, if, if you have five or six trees, I say band them all. Um, if you on an acre of property and, you know, have 95 trees, well, you might want to um, concentrate on the trees that are closest to your residence or where you are. Okay. And how long do those bands effectively last? I know you've yes. some pictures. Of, yes. I know other stuff gets caught on them, but they do, you know, yeah. if you had to tell someone it can probably last this many days, what would you say? Oh, so, so we usually put them up right after Thanksgiving, and we tell people to keep them up through April. Um, as long as, you know, you don't have a lot of leaves on there. I mean, some people never change their bands at all. What some uh, homeowners have told me is what they have done is where their bands are, if it starts getting really big and full, they just stick another band right above it. And they just put a second band. Instead of taking one off and redoing mm -hmm. it, they just throw another one up above or below it. Okay. Um, I, I did fail to mention the height of the band. It doesn't really matter. I'm just over five feet tall, so I'm going to put it somewhere where it's comfortable for me. I have small children, so I want it up high enough where they're not going to touch it. Or if you have a dog that might jump up on things, you might want to stick it up out of that, that dog's reach. You don't have to stick it up, you know, six or eight feet tall. Most people just do it at breast height on a tree, whatever's the comfortable location for okay. them. <laughs> and do, would other sticky products work in a band, like inverted duct tape or something of that nature? It probably would, um, is, but I don't know how long that would actually last, you know. Um, I don't know how, how sticky that would retain, like if there's a lot of rain or, um, you know, ice events or something like that. I'm not sure how long that would stay sticky. Um, generally, we, we really do like to recommend that, that tangle foot um, material or the stick and stop, I think, is another brand name that, that we have out there. So I can comment on that. <clears throat> I actually tried that a couple of years ago. Oh, you we did? Had, we yeah. had something. And, you know, it works really good for a few days, but that duct tape breaks down in the sun. That's what uh, I was And then it, you know, it's not totally waterproof. The more stuff gets on it, the more it breaks down. So it'll, it'll work for a few days, but definitely not long term. Yeah. So that's, okay. that's my two cents on that whole that's spiel. Let's see, let's see. Do you have any data on how many female moths trapped per band constitutes a moderate or low infestation? Yes. So um, let's see if I can remember this off the top of my head. 
So I want to say, um, you know, I'm not going to give you a number. Oh, yes, I am right now. Um, 45 or less is light. 46 to 90 is moderate. Okay. I just, okay. So we have another question. Any issues with the aerial spray and the vegetation? No. We have, we have not, other than people calling because they're worried about it. Now, we, the, I, I did not work with the city the last time they did the spray, but from what I understand, there was a lot of outreach before it was being done. So, so people would know why we're doing it and what's going to happen if there were any effects. But I do not know of any information about, you know, the BT landing on a plant and, um, you know, damaging it. Like, like if you put oil on a plant during the summertime, you might get burnt leaves from that. So I, I don't know of any information about that. Gotcha. And a couple people have asked about growing degree days. Uh, do you happen to know the growing de degree days when females emerge and lay eggs? Um, yeah, two people asked, you know, the growing degree day numbers when they emerge and or lay eggs. Yes. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. But if you email me, I can find out because I know I have it. I keep a, a list of that kind of stuff. I was trying to find it, and I couldn't find it real quick. So I did see that pop up, and I was like, oh, I know I have that. Um. <laughs> so I found it. I found one thing from, and this is from the University of Massachusetts. Um, they use a, a base temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and they say egg hatch occurs between 177 and 243 growing degree days. Um, that's all I could find. I, I suspect, again, if you dig more, you'll find, like, for the full life cycle and stuff. But right. um, for those of you on the thing now, 177 to 243 is when your eggs are going to hatch. Um, and if you want more, I guess get in touch with Lori or I, and we can try that's to right, get yeah. you some actual literature. Yeah, exactly. Um, Okay, do you, so it says, can you show us where to get the wrap? I have seen bad reviews on the paper wrapping where you apply the tangle foot. Okay, so like the tar paper? A, a preferred, I, I guess so. This is from John Simons. Maybe John can um, put a comment in there if he's still there, but that was his question. Yeah, so here in Charlotte, we have a couple um, places that, that sell cankerworm supplies. Um, I don't know if the gentleman's from the Charlotte area, but Blackhawk Hardware, um, Little Hardware, and Renfro Hardware are some of the ones that I know sell the supplies. And so, um, and I, I honestly think you can get that wrap stuff on the, the roll probably from, like, a packing store. Um, so any of, like, the, the storage facilities, the million that we have around Charlotte, because um, you use it to wrap furniture. Um, okay. So So they may be able to find it there, but... Those, those three, if the, if the gentleman is in Charlotte, I know those three hardware supply stores do sell that. Yeah, that yeah. So we'll do and it comes in clear or black. So. Okay. So we'll do one last question. It's 2 o'clock. Uh, does the infestation occur in the foothills and mountains around Asheville? And then I guess we'll wrap another one in here. Um, how far has this infestation spread in the U.S.? Is, is Charlotte a, an anomaly, or do we have this in other places as well? We are an anomaly. Other other places, like around the D.C. metro area, around Virginia, they'll have outbreaks for a couple of years, and then they go away. Um, you know, every time I read from, like, different cities, they're like, oh, we had an outbreak for two years. It's terrible. I'm like, uh, how about 30? So, yes, um, Charlotte is definitely very different than a lot of the other cities. Folks, there's a... a Owen Martin said U-Haul sells a clear plastic wrap, FYI, and also... Um, if you do a search for hand stretch plastic wrap. And finally, Lori, one last question. I can't resist because these are good ones. Okay. Can, you, can okay. you spray the ground when they start crawling out from the ground? Um, you'd have to spray uh, an insecticide directly on the female. Because remember, she doesn't have any mouth parts. So it would have to be an insecticide that she's going to absorb, and that's it. So it's not like... Um, like cockroaches, you put out certain things because they clean themselves and they eat it and they ingest it, and that causes a problem. She's not doing any of that. Um, I, mean, I, I, I wonder, I've never thought about it, but I guess maybe you could spray like a wasp spray or something on it that may have an effect, but um, I, I wouldn't think so. Um, so the BT, again, is affecting the caterpillars because they have to physically eat it. Right, and I, I don't know of any good sprays that you spray on that they just walk over I don't either. That they Not that you could spray on the soil. A lot of things have to actually touch or get inside an insect for it to work. 
Exactly. And since those females aren't eating, she doesn't have mouth parts, she's not right. going to get it into her body, so probably right. not. Okay, we'll stop there, folks. You're going to need to get their CEUs. Uh, Lori, thanks again. Folks, if you have questions, feel free to get a hold of Lori or me, and we will try to uh, get you the answer. One last thing, Walmart also has these stretchy plastics, so this stuff is available in plenty of places. So those of you looking for CEUs, give me 30, not even 30 seconds, and I will get your link uh, passed out, and you can do that. Uh, let me know if there's any questions, and thanks a lot, everybody. Yes, thank you all for joining us. Thank <clears throat> you.